All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to Second Monthly Life number 21. As I mentioned briefly at the beginning, this will be our last meetup for this year because usually we take time in August and December. So next meetup will be um, in January after New Year's. As usually, I'm really happy to see so many faces here from so many different time zones. Today, we're going to have a very interesting discussion. We'll feature Open Data Toronto. Um, here on the call with us is uh, Mackenzie Nichols, um, who is from Open Data Toronto, and he'll provide a deep dive into uh, Toronto's Open Data Portal. He'll be focusing on how the portal is organized, um, where they've had some struggles, and how they, uh, they have addressed these struggles. Alongside with um, Mackenzie, we're going to have a quick recap um, of the vision and ongoing efforts um, of the Second 3.0 Task Force from um, Alex Gostev. Um, as I said, this will be our last meetup, so it's, um, it's a good idea to have a recap of what we've done so far. The topic for today is data for the people, the evolution of Toronto's open data ecosystem. The agenda for today is welcome and introduction, which is me right now. Uh, after that, we're going to have the quick update from Alex Gostev. Then we're going to have the presentation uh, for Toronto's open data portal, which will probably take around 20 minutes. Um, it's fine if we take a bit more, we can regulate that. And then if people have some stuff to do, they can drop and see the recording after that. Um, after the presentation, we'll open the floor for a Q&A session. This is your time to shine. So feel free to drop questions. Uh, I mean, to ask questions or um, you can also drop your questions in the chat. After that, um, if there are some community announcements and sharing, if there is something that you want to sh that you want to share with the community, um, you have the opportunity to do so. And last part is closing remarks. As always, I'll try to be very quick. Um, before I turn the spotlight to Alex and Mackenzie. Um, let's do a few housekeeping um, notes just to set the stage for a fruitful session. So we have um, a meeting notes document. I dropped the link in the chat. This is our single source of truth document. Um, you can open it. You can write down your name, affiliation, uh, what brings you to Seeken. And also, if you want to drop some thoughts um, for future meetups, suggest um, topic, add things to the agenda, um, this is the place where you can do it as well. This is the place where you can find all the useful uh, links um, to our social media channels, presentation, um and and all that now re regarding q a there are two ways to ask a question if you're feeling brave uh, you can raise your hand and go ahead with your question if you're not feeling brave today no worries uh, you can just drop your question in the chat and i'll bring it up for you um, we are here to learn and share, so don't hesitate to jump in with questions. Before um, I give the mic to Alex, let me just um, remind you that our newsletter is out. You can find it on LinkedIn. Mm, and also, if you've subscribed, you can subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, you can subscribe on our um, website. You can find the link uh, in the in the this uh, in the meeting note document and in the presentation on screen, and then you have it right in your inbox. 
And last but not least, the session is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. All the relevant links uh, you'll find in the meeting document that I'm going to share once again now when I finish my introduction. And with all set, um, let me pass it to Alex first and then we'll welcome Mackenzie. Hey everybody, uh, it's 50, 52 participants on the call, which is quite cool. Thanks for coming. It's a great time to, to see each other and basically hear the stories of success around CCAN. So uh, my quick update uh, would be uh, on several things. First, it's the end of the year. Uh, it's not the end technically, so we still have uh, one and a half months to to deliver stuff and to make second better but uh it was really interesting exciting year with a post project that uh, joel nativitat brought uh, brought to the community along with the fellows from uh, pittsburgh university it was really big uh big release of uh, CCAN 2.10 at the start of the year. Really heavy, big thing with a lot of updates. Kudos to the core dev team. And uh, 2.11, it's a chance for it to uh, still be this year. Um, then Brad Jones, video guides on how to install CCAN. It was quite visible that people are using them. Uh, and and providing a positive feedback, so it worked. Thanks a lot to Yana for monthly lives, for newsletters, for basically communicating that that community exists, add intangibility to the community. That's that's a big thing. Uh, when I'm communicating um, to a new people that I want to bring into community, I'm usually give a, a YouTube channel and discussions in CCAN and pull requests in CCAN. So basically, these are proofs that, that the life is there, which is important really to, to, to engage new people, which I'm, which I'm usually doing uh, on the constant basis, basically running the reach, uh, outreach campaigns to engage, to engage more and more and to inform that CCAN is there and we're ready to collaborate and basically onboard everyone who is interested. Um, on CCAN 3.0, uh, 3 uh, basically we have a scope uh, that, that, that we pushed through uh, our discussions and um, the things that got overall agreement into that they're feasible and um, they would not break stuff. This is what we want. So modernizing tech stack with HTMX edition. This is something that is delivered on the say pilot uh, as a pilot, and then expansion would happen into other areas of the code. Uh, but this thing can mark can be marked as done as a positive addition on the technical side. Uh, then integration of uh, alternative search engines, the possibility of, of and the easiness of this integration. And we're targeting Elasticsearch as the first one. Uh, thanks a lot to Dragon uh, for, and Datopian uh, for, for contributing uh, to this line of work. And then uh, UI revamp is the project within, within the CCAN 3.0 where we want to streamline uh, user interface for out-of-the-box installations. So it was a chance for us to engage with wider community, which we did. We have several candidates. Uh, we basically need two people. Uh, one is developer and one is designer. And so the interviews would start this next week. These are next week. So my idea is that before December, we'll start working on this, and it would take around four months. And with all these things delivered, we can release second point uh, 
but I, I would really focus on what would happen next because uh, we have a lot of stuff to do, a lot of ideas. And with more collaboration within community, we, we see that there are, there are so many different actors within our uh, ecosystem. So I would invite you to participate in discussions. Uh, I will launch one today, tomorrow on the future of CCAN. So let's contribute, let's collaborate, let's exchange ideas on what could be next things and how CCAN should involve evolve and um, then we would be able to form a roadmap for 2024. Of course, at the moment, that would be a vision and then we need resources to make it happen. But let's start with something early on. I think that would be that would be really nice to, to start one and a half months before the end of this year. That's it for me. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Robert, I think you raised your hand. No, I just wanted to clap my hand. Oh, OK, <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah, I think it's been a great year for CCAN. Um, and next year, I think it's going to be even greater one. We are all super motivated. Mm, and we'll definitely see the results. Okay, I think now it's time to welcome our guest, Mackenzie. Mac, let me know if you can share your screen. Yeah, let me try to do that right now. Okay, your can you all see my yeah. screen? Yes. Okay, great. And before I get started, Joanna, would you prefer that I wait for questions at the end or should I take them as I go? Do you have a preference? Usually people wait for the Q&A session, but then if someone is really cannot wait, maybe they can shoot it out. But usually what we do is we just wait for the Q&A session. Sure, I'll wait for the Q&A session. That's totally fine. Um, Perfect. Yeah, and it's okay if I just get started then. Yes, please, go ahead. Great, okay, thank you, Ioana. And, and thanks again for introducing me so well. You've already done most of the work there. I'll, just to be polite, I'll, I'll do it one last time. Um, my name is Mackenzie. I'm a software developer on the City of Toronto Open Data team. Um, we've been using CCAN for a number of years now. And what I'm hoping to talk about today is um, a couple of things. Mostly I want to showcase our portal a bit, but then I want to peel back the curtain, uh, discuss with you all about how it works, discuss with you all some of the challenges that we've had, not so much as CCAN users, because overall we've had a really good experience with CCAN, but more as an open data portal and how that ties back into CCAN. Um, and then I want to open the floor for questions. Um, before I get started, though, I, I do want to preface my whole talk by saying, um, while we at the City of Toronto do think we're doing a decent job with our open data portal, um, by no means do we think that we're uh, head and shoulders above the rest. And, and a big reason we've come to talk here is because is we want to engage with the community uh, looking for feedback criticism or ideas so as we're going or as we get to the q a session please don't be too polite if you see something that looks wrong or you see something that we're doing that you think could be done better uh call us out uh, that's a big part of the reason we're here is we, we want to engage with the community so that we can improve our portal a bit so without any further ado let me get started um now uh, i'm going to give a little bit of context to our portal introduce our team some of our use case talk a little bit about the city of toronto as i go um but hopefully i won't spend too too much time on that we can spend some time uh actually talking uh actually having some discussion in some q a so first i'll introduce our team uh, just to give you all an idea of the the, the size of, of the people uh, the number of people actually that are maintaining our portal uh, there are five of us right now uh, we've got three software developers myself and two others um, we've got a supervisor who oversees us and a couple of other projects within the city. Uh, and then we've got a comms lead who manages our inbox, our blog, and our Twitter. Um, among the five of us, we're, we're managing a few things. We're managing Shore, uh, open.toronto.ca, our portal. Uh, we're also managing some ETL engines that move data to that portal. And I'll talk a little bit about those in a bit. 
Uh, now, let's just get into our portal. Now, I'm about to introduce an open data portal. And I can imagine a lot of the people here are uh, working on open data portals themselves. So this might seem a little bit redundant. I just wanted to do that just so I can contextualize and level set with everybody as much as I can, just to make sure we're all on the same page, you know? So um, introducing open.toronto.ca, it's our website. Um, just like a lot of open data portals, uh, you come to get data about the city bureaucracy um, generated and managed by the city bureaucracy. Um, in, to get onto our website, you don't need an account, you don't need permissions, you don't need uh, to log in or anything. You just come, you click, you download, you're good to go. Um, you, we, we at the portal provide data is as downloads and in many cases via an API, thanks to CCAN. Uh, and the uses that you can use that data for are for anything, including commercial. If you take a data set, you make a million dollars off of it, uh, you don't even have to tell us. We'd like it if you did, but uh, I digress. Now, okay, so far, I think everything's been pretty clear. Most of you probably knew a lot of that already. Let me actually jump into the actual portal and show you how it looks. And I've got it open here. So open.toronto.ca, got a search bar. Uh, we try to make this as intuitive as we can. We try to just match Google as best as we can. So we're hoping that the users will come into this portal, type in what they're looking for, maybe something to do with fires, fire incidents at the city, or maybe if they're curious, they can come down here and see the changes that we've made, new data sets that we've added in the recent months. Uh, before I dig into the actual portal, we do also have a blog and some FAQs and Q&A uh, that we get from the public that we posted up here. I won't get into that. Um, just wanted to let you know. So let's say I come in here, search bar, nothing special there. Using a lot of CCAN's built-in functionality. I'm um, using Solar to ping different parts of our CCAN data sets. And sure enough, we get a CCAN looking interface here. It's not CCAN, but I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, on the left, handful of data set filters using metadata that City of Toronto staff have curated ourselves. Things like the data publisher, some civic issues that our city has identified as important for things to have data on some general topics, and then some other stuff. And you're gonna see each of these blocks, you've probably already figured out, is a data set. In CCAN parlance, each of these is a CCAN package. Some of them we label as retired, meaning that it's no longer going to be updated, no longer going to be supported by a subject matter expert. Some of them are not. I'll click on one now just to give you an idea of what our data set page, our package pages look like. Once I've come to this new page, there's a lot going on here, but quickly you'll realize on the left-hand side, we've got some details. This in CCAN parlance again, is for the most part package metadata. And then on the right, we've got something a little more granular. Some more package information, our notes section. But then in this accordion here, a number of different things, and I'll go through each of these. First, data preview right out of the box. This is a CCAN preview for, uh, I think it's the uh, tabular. We also do maps here for spatial data, and I'll show you that in a bit. We show our data features if our data set is in CCAN's data store, something we leverage quite a bit, and I'll talk about uh, in a moment. We've got two things here, data quality and download data that I'll get to last because they're the more complicated bits. Uh, we also have an explore data section, which links people to CCAN's built-in data visualization uh, module. And then a for developers section, which is uh, a custom little ditty that we threw together, giving some people, developers, some ideas on how to leverage this data programmatically using Python, Node, or R. Nothing too complicated there, nothing too fancy, right? Let me talk about data quality and download data, because I think these are the two things um, that uh, are both successes and in some ways weaknesses of the City of Toronto Open Data Portal. Um, data quality is something we've been doing for a couple of years. It's something custom that we've added to the portal. We, for each package and each of its resources, will evaluate the package's metadata and assign scores based on its contents. We have tailored that code very specifically to the City of Toronto open data use case. And all of that code is open on GitHub. 
Um, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about that um, in the Q&A section, and I will talk a little bit about how we leverage it. But for now, I'll gloss over it quickly. You'll see that here we give an overall score and a grade. That grade is just basically gold, silver, or bronze based on how high the score is. And then we subdivide that score into five, we call them dimensions, freshness, metadata, accessibility, completeness, and usability. And for each of these, we have a number of rules that you could see if you click that are evaluated on each data set, either on a daily or weekly basis, depending on the data set, automatically. And then that's put into here. This, what you're seeing, is the CCAN view. And it's reading data actually from a whole other CCAN data set. Now, I'll, I'll be happy to deep dive into that if people are interested, but I'll leave that for the Q&A if, if people are interested. Now, that's our data quality section. We do also have a download data section. You can see here that for any resource associated with this package, in this case, there's one, but there can be multiple. We provide people the ability to select a format and then download here. Nothing wild about that, right? The one thing that the city of Toronto does that we haven't seen a, a lot of our other peers do, and this isn't necessarily a good thing. If anything, it's it's a point of concern of ours is, and I'll, I'll do this for another data set here that I pulled up. We have multiple different formats for different kinds of data sets. The previous data set that we were looking at, fire incidents, it is a non-spatial data set. So we define that as something that doesn't have coordinates in it, you know, lat longs, polygons, or lines, or something like that. And in that case, you get the CSV, the JSON, or the XML option to download. If somebody's looking at a spatial data set, like this one about Toronto free public Wi-Fi areas, which are just, you know, areas in the city with free public Wi-Fi, you get a spatial, a series of spatial formats, GeoJSON, CSV, uh, with coordinates shoved into it a geo package or a shape file. And you get those in two different coordinate reference systems. We create these files using something called data store caching. I'll talk a little bit more about the details of that later, um, but it's something that uh, we've had a number of our users ask for, especially for spatial data. Uh, it's something that has been working well, but we have concerns about long-term. I'll discuss a little bit about that when I talk about pain points, but I just wanted to let you all know that is something that we do. That is, though, for the most part, how the portal works. Now, normally I'd pause for questions. I don't think there are going to be any. Um, you and I do want to check with you. There's not any hands up in the chat or anything, are there? Um, so, so, sorry, say it again. There are no hands up in the chat or anything, right? Would it be okay if I? Proceed. No, there there are two questions, um, but we can address them in the Q and A session. Sure. Thank or you. somebody just raised their hand. Yeah, you know what? Sorry, I shouldn't have asked. But let's let's keep it for the Q and A session. <laughs> just to keep things overly. Sorry. Yeah, that, I think that's the best way to go. Yeah, agreed. Okay. So. Let's talk a little bit about what's behind the curtain. We've all seen the portal. Now let's look to see how it works behind the scenes. So um, we kind of um, generalized the different things that are operating behind the scenes with the portal in this slide here. Um, in the center, in this white block, we've got CCAN. Our CCAN instance leverages the data store extension pretty extensively. Uh, but we still have a number of resources that are stored in the file store as well. Um, that CCAN instance is what's underneath that website I just showed you, which is not a CCAN instance. That website I just showed you, open.toronto.ca, is technically a WordPress with a custom theme. That WordPress isn't doing very much work. It's really calling data that has been curated and organized in CCAN and then showing it in a way uh, with colors and buttons and accessibility standards that the city of Toronto is okay with. Now, in this context though, there's a couple other things happening. If users want to access that data, not through the user interface, but rather through an API, they can do that. And we will provide them links in those pages that you saw 
to show them how to hit the API in CCAN directly. So they have the choice between the UI or the API. Now, uh, this is not a lot of detail here in how we get data into the portal. Um, but in short, we have a number of ways that we get data into the portal. And this is actually one of the pain points that I'll be discussing too. Um, we have a number of different ETL engines. We've got multiple for historic reasons. We're in the process of trying to reduce that number from three to well, ideally less than three. Um, but we um, use a number of these processes to grab data from many different places within the city bureaucracy, um, make sure that it is able to fit in CCAN, which really requires very little work. And then we upload it either directly to the data store using some custom code that I'll discuss in a bit um, or into the file store in some cases. Now, to clarify one thing, that means it is very rare that we have users or even open data admins manually loading data into CCAN using the UI. The majority of our data getting into CCAN is put in there via different automated processes. So via CCAN's various APIs, usually called by one of these ETL engines. There are a couple of cases where we will manually upload data to CCAN, but we try to avoid those. Um, we we try to avoid those because it increases the overhead and the amount of manual work that is required to put and manage the data in CCAN. And additionally, with these ETL engines, it reduces the amount of work that the data owners have to do to actually put that data up on the portal. We've had some pretty good success by telling data owners, hey, don't worry, just give us access and we'll grab it and process it for you. Instead of having to tell data owners, hey, we need you to process and upload data uh, by yourself. Um, uh, happy to talk a little bit about that a little bit later too. Now, I mentioned data store caching earlier, and, and data store caching was how for our different data sets. I'll show you again here. In the download data section, we will provide many different formats, sometimes in many different coordinate reference systems or projections. This is a overview of how this works. Um, basically, what will happen is when new data is inserted into the data store, something triggers a custom extension that we've built, also publicly available up on GitHub called CKNext IOTrans. Could probably use a better name, but I digress. What that does is it processes that data, and depending on whether or not the data is geometric or non geometric, it takes that data store data and adds additional resources into the file store, one for each of the formats created for that data set. So if it's a geometric data set, eight file store resources will be added. If it's a non-geometric data set, only three will be added. And that's based on these formats that I've been talking about here. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, our usership. Now that I've peeled back the curtain just a little bit, uh, how people are leveraging the portal, um, both inside and outside the city bureaucracy. Uh, because while we do have a lot of users uh, in the public, and that's great, um, there's uh, a lot of users that we know of that are within the city bureaucracy. Um, and, and at first we were like, oh, that's kind of wild. Uh, but then when we stepped back and we thought about it, it made sense to us uh, because the city of Toronto is a very big city. I think we've got some 10 million people, I think. Don't quote me on that. Um, and the uh, bureaucracy itself has got over 40 different divisions, each of which have wildly different missions. Uh, imagine trying to compare Toronto Public Health, which manages things like our COVID response to um city planning that is required to deal with like zoning issues in the city wildly different and so each of them we treat like distinct corporate entities like a whole different company and so for us it makes sense that each of those different groups are coming to us to get data because for for example toronto police to go to toronto public health there's all kinds of different data management practices um, 
that they'll, they'd have to follow in order just to make that one connection. And imagine doing that with every other division in the city. That's a lot of work. So instead, they give the data to us, and then it becomes kind of a marketplace, both for the public and for the city bureaucracy, to grab that data. Because sharing can be pretty hard when it comes down to the technical nitty gritty of it, especially when it comes to networking, and especially when it comes to security. And I'll skip over this. Now, um, talking about usership, yes, we do have a lot of uh, city bureaucrats using our data. Um, we do also have a lot of citizens using our data. Uh, I've listed a bunch of um, citizen run initiatives uh, that are up that we know of that have been used. Um, there's a number of them here, and I'm not going to talk about each one. We don't have time for that. Um, but I will say that one of the pain points uh, that we as an open data portal has experienced, not one that I'll harp on to too much, um, is that when somebody makes something with our data, uh, we as the open data program want to brag about it. We want to say, oh, look at this really cool thing that somebody made with something we provided. Uh, and we don't have a way to, to accurately track that. Sure, we know um, you know, what regions and in some cases what website refers have been sending us requests and a vague idea of who's grabbing data. But unless somebody tells us, hey, I built an app using your data, uh, we won't know that they did. So um, that's definitely a pain point that we have. Okay, talking about pain points. Um, we've got a couple. Um, again, uh, not a lot of these are, are CCAN related, but they're all connected to CCAN and how we've implemented CCAN somehow. And so I'll, I'll get into the weeds of some of that as I go through this section. There are three major ones that I can identify um, or that I can talk about today at the time that I got. One is with scaling ETLs. One is with that data store caching that I mentioned earlier. And one is with the uh, this idea of catalog cleanliness. So first, scaling ETLs. Um, we have a lot of data owners. What do we say? Over 40 different divisions. And each of those have several teams in them. Uh, and each of those data owners up, you know, provide data to us in a different way. Some of them have a database with a view sitting there waiting for us. We just grab the data from that, that every day. Some of them have a zip file on some guy's laptop that he needs to manually merge with something else on some other guy's laptop. And we need to be able to work with that too. As we have more and more data sets, the size of those data sets and the variety of those data sets is also growing. And thusly, our approach of not having users responsible for uploading data, but having our own developers responsible for uploading data is putting strain on uh, City of Toronto staff. Uh, city of toronto open data staff it is more work for us to make sure that we can get data into the portal rather than the data owners next talking about data store caching um, the process is slow uh, it can be slow for big data sets it can take several minutes um, sometimes 20 or 30 minutes to cache a large geometric data set and when that happens daily, we fortunately haven't had outages or problems in the way it's designed, there aren't going to be any. But that being said, the the tax that it pulls on a server is significant because it's a lot of work transforming the database table into many different files happening over several minutes. That can get expensive. Additionally, it can be finicky with different kinds of varieties uh, and our implementation of it is not the most graceful. It's not easy to take our extension and plug it into your own CCAN instance if you wanted to copy this. Uh, it requires a lot of custom code to actually copy and paste it into your own setup. This, I won't go over, um, but this being a snapshot of why that implementation is so finicky. Happy to talk about this if anybody has any questions either now or offline. And then finally, and this isn't, um, uh, this this idea of catalog cleanliness, I, I know is not unique to the city of Toronto because we've spoken with other open data teams and they face this every day. Uh, we've got a lot of data up on the portal and a lot of them are old. And a lot of people who own that data set have left or have forgotten about it. And um, that puts a lot of strain on open data staff to keep things up to date, to keep things fresh. Um, we have a lot of file store resources and as much as possible, we'd like to put those into the data store for a number of reasons. And that requires work. That's more load put onto the open data team. 
Now, as a footnote, our open our, our data quality scoring helps us keep track of what data sets have become stale and which ones haven't. Uh, but it only points them out for us. It doesn't clean them for us. Um, this is a, a slide I was gonna uh, that I provided just to give a little bit of a high level of how our data quality scoring works. Um, I, I'm seeing that I'm kind of leaking over in time, so I'll do this quick, and then I'm going to open up the field for questions. Our data quality scoring requires a couple of different players. First and foremost, the logic that we have it running on lives right now on an Apache Airflow instance. That Apache Airflow instance will periodically call CCAN and run through each of its packages. Looking at its package metadata, it will use that logic to use some logic to assign a score to that package. It will take that and it will actually put it into its own CCAN data store resource. We've got a whole uh, CCAN package, pardon me, just for data quality scores for all the other packages in the portal. And then we provide that. Um, we not only provide that CCAN package to, to people who want to see it, but we also leverage that in a custom CCAN view, which is what you all see when you come to our portal and you come to our data quality section. Okay, I've talked a lot. I've gone a little bit over time. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'd be happy to start the Q&A now and what I'll do for, for uh, as we get started is I'll leave up the info. So if you all wanna get in touch with me after or someone else on my team, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out. We are so happy to talk with other CCAN users about this stuff. Thanks again for your attention. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, I will include the presentation in our meeting notes document so people can have a look at it. And um, I will also include your contacts. Now let's open the floor for our Q&A session. There are a few questions in the chat, but I can see that several people are raising hands. So let's let's start with them and then we'll proceed with um, what's in the chat. So, Masoud, I think you were first. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you so much. That was a really insightful presentation. Uh, I, I put two questions in the, in the chat. Uh, one is that, can you not put a mechanism in place through which you would be able to identify or um, some somewhat get some some sort of information in terms of um, who um, who does what you know who uses what kind of data for what purpose that's one question and the second thing uh, because you mentioned that you've got lots of difficulties in terms of um, uploading the data can you not uh, create a gateway like a plugin or something that uh, it, 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 it it becomes like the first step for uploading data, claiming it, labeling it, structuring it, whatever, and then be fed into the system. So that would be um, um, taking the burden off uh, in terms of the data accumulation and data capturing. Yeah, great questions. Um, let me I'll do the first one first. Can we put something in place to identify who uses what? Um, sort of. So we. Um, we've got a product on any city of Toronto site where we have an idea of our um, traffic. We have an idea of um, where requests to our site are coming from, what pages are being accessed. Um, and when I say where these things are coming from, I'm talking about uh, in terms of city, in terms of the type of machine that they're making the request from, sometimes information about where that request um, was referred from. So like, where was the link? that they clicked to get onto open.toronto.ca slash fire incidents data, for example. So we have a, we can guess, um, we can guess, but when it comes to how people are using the data, um, we don't have a way to scour the internet looking for, um, looking through every product that leverages any kind of data set um, that has a link to open.toronto.ca. We've done cursory looks into code that is open on, for example, GitHub. So people who might be making a project on there um, who have posted a link, um, but those usually don't um, produce the fruitful results that we're looking for. We have the most success in that regard uh, through like old fashioned feet on the pavement, 
uh, work where we're talking to people in civic technology groups throughout the city, talking with people that we know are using the data because they're always asking us questions about it uh, and keeping in touch with them to understand what they're using it for. So in terms of like an automated solution, um, if it exists, we haven't figured it out. Now, um, about the uploading data issue. So um, I think there's a couple different ways to answer this, but I'm going to do my best to, to answer it well. Um, CCAN has a number of really good extensions that allow um, like non-CCAN administrators, so like a data owner, to come in, use the CCAN user interface, and just plug in a CSV. Uh, some with certain extensions that CSV will then be automatically fed into the data store, create previews and so on. There's a lot of really cool stuff that CCAN has out of the box. Um, we'll use some of that. Uh, that said, um, we have tried our best not to put work onto the data owners. We don't want to tell a data owner to make a password and a login. Uh, and then log in to this user interface and upload something for a couple of different reasons. One, it's it's extra work for them and that makes it really easy for them not to give us data. Um, two, uh, they'll make mistakes. They'll upload data with issues in it and possibly um, break public facing data set pages. Uh, and so those are, those are two of our motivations behind not engaging down that road. That being said, then that puts a lot of work on us to basically make sure that our code the ETL engines that I mentioned before can go to where they're storing their data, grab it, process it in a way that CCAN will be okay with it, and then feed it directly into CCAN. Um, that's those are my short answers, and I'd be happy to blab more about this another time. But I hope that that at least for now uh, covers what you're looking for. Does it? Um, in a sense, yes. Uh, and, and my last question would be: Am I correct to understand that you actually? like actually uh, like a data set exchange that would be fed by different data owners uh, throughout time uh, in a hope that in longer run it would be the go-to place for intercity departments and whatnot to access it and uh, utilize it in, in their own way whatever so there would be like a in a sense like a single source of truth kind of a thing so this is a really good question. Um, I'll tell you honestly, when the portal was first thrown together, that was not the intent. The intent was to increase transparency of the city bureaucracy, to improve accountability of the city so that citizens of Toronto can see, oh, I know what, um, I know what kind of data that the Parks, Forestry and Recreation Division has on you know, the, the, the health of trees, for example. They're accountable and I can see the information that they have. That said, over time, as the data on it grew, more and more city bureaucrats realized, oh, hey, we can just get the data right off of here. Uh, this is way easier than going through all of the different networking protocols to directly connect with a different city division. Uh, like a data as a service, basically. Say that again? Like, like a data as a service. Sure. Yeah, you could say that. Um, it, it's it's funny, though, because I, I don't want to claim that the portal was built to do this. Um, it's just something that happened as a very happy byproduct. Now, more and more, we are wonder we have, the city is trying to strategize how to place open data as a centerpiece in, in Toronto for that like single source of truth. But that's a, a larger, much more like a uh, million mile up view conversation. Um, that that the city is still trying to sort out. Uh, so the short answer to your question is, we didn't mean for it to go this way. It sure feels like it's going that way. Um, and there's a chance that it will be more official uh, in that capacity, but not sure about that last one yet. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you as well. Um, I can see the Chilo 86 is raising their hand. Uh, yeah, Thank, thanks a lot for your presentation. That was uh, extremely insightful. I'm, uh, I'm a CCAN developer in Berlin at the Telecom, and I've been building pipelines from a data warehouse uh, to feed uh, pipelines that feed metadata to CCAN from, uh, from an, uh, an in-house uh, data warehouse. So my question concerns the 
data quality score you just showed. We've been having some, uh, I had to, I'm building a monitoring system. So I started with a quantity analysis, just like, uh, just create dashboards, which, which uh, the, um, I have uh, dashboards, which um, actually just tell me the average, how many from the chosen metadata attributes we have, how many we have, and I have a score, which is also quantitative. But we're trying to move into qualitative, I have seen on one of your slides uh, what ninety five percent as a quality score. So I wanted to ask how robust that uh, that figure is. I mean, because I don't know if I don't know what what are the real metrics you're using to to give us these figures. Yeah. So super good question. Um, I'll, I'll give you the short answer now, but uh, you wanna, I don't know if this is okay with you, but we've got a couple of like blog posts and posts that we've documented like the actual numbers behind all of this, that might be a little more useful for, for posterity's sake. Could I share that with you after, Ioana, to, to share with the rest of the stuff? Yeah, definitely, you, you can. That'd be great, yes. Yeah. I will include it, we, we're uh, usually uh, so creating have, like a recap blog post, so I will include them there as well, and also under the video on YouTube. Sure. So, yeah. Okay, I'll make sure that I send that to you after, but also I'm happy to answer your question right now. Um, as best as I can. There's just, okay. you know, there's numbers and math and stuff involved and I don't remember, I haven't memorized all of it. So I'll tell you what I can tell you off the top of my head. And then these posts will give you some of the, the meat and potatoes, some of the guts. Okay. So this score, this numeric score is based on these five categories, freshness, metadata, accessibility, completeness, and usability. And now at a high level, those don't mean anything, but each of these categories is actually just like a group of rules, a group of logical checks that we run uh, against okay. package and resource metadata. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, what we've done, and this is something that we as the open data team have decided based off of conversations with city staff, conversations with uh, pub users in the public, uh, and then um, some of our needs at the city of Toronto open data team, we have put weighting on each of these categories to make it so that, for example, freshness is worth much more than completeness okay yep. so Definitely. for example Definitely. freshness is worth i think it's like 20 or 30 percent of this score but okay. usability is only worth about five um, we've done that on purpose because at the city of toronto open data team freshness is one of our big pain points we have a lot of data that sits there unchanged for a long period of time and um we want to be able to see data sets that are not fresh. And so if this is a low score, we want it to affect the overall score. And we and that therefore tells us at the open data team, hey, this is something that we need to act on. We need to go talk to the data owner and figure out a way to work with them to update it or retire it. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, sec um, secondly, uh, what about the correctness of the data? That's a great question. Yeah. We we do not have anything for that. Um, okay. We What we do is we say to the public and to the data owner, um, look, as long as you don't have any privacy concerns uh, or uh, PII data uh, in your data set, um, we will publish it. If you have something that is incorrect in this, there is no way that the open data team can validate that. Okay. We're not subject matter experts on fire incidents, short-term rentals, free public Wi-Fi. We're not going to pretend to be experts in all that. That being said, because this is public facing and because we have pretty decent connections with the public, if somebody sees a mistake, they'll call it out. And when they call it out, they'll have a contact directly in the city who they can call it out to. And then they can work with okay. the bureaucrats that own that data set to actually fix it. But short answer, no, we have nothing for correctness on here. Okay. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have uh, several people raising hands. I'm not sure who raised their hand first, but let's go with um, Fergo, then Amanda, then Masut, and then we'll go to chat. Please go ahead. Hi, hi Mackenzie. Thank you so much for a brilliant uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, I'd like to understand who do you think within the organization is the strongest supporter for open data? Um, 
I guess maybe declaring maybe a, a originally technical kind of background such as yourself, but also knowing with our customers uh, in order for programs to kind of sustain themselves and grow, they kind of do need what you might call organization or business champions. And also being curious as to your own background working in um, the world of kind of nature and the, the lots of kind of interconnected challenges within governments being kind of nature, biodiversity, uh, plus lots of other different sectors, kind of your maybe your views of sponsors and key sectors that are users of the data that you're making so so well available. Sure. OK, so first question about um, thanks for the question, first of all. Um, First question about the uh, champions within the city of Toronto bureaucracy. Um, we're lucky. We've got a, a good number of them. Um, to, to name a few that are doing really well, our transportation division is filled with, to use kind of a crass word, absolute killers. Uh, they're, they're very technically sound. They're very organized. Uh, and they're fairly cutting edge. And for a big city like Toronto to have somebody who's um, using cutting edge tech is, is admirable. So they do a really good job of giving us lots of big, shiny, useful, up-to-date, fresh data sets. And we, we value our, our relationship with them quite a bit. Um, talking about, specifically to my background, uh, it sounds like you looked me up. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I feel honored almost. Um, uh, we do a lot of work with another very large um, division within the city of Toronto called our Parks, Forestry, and Recreation Division. And they manage tons of stuff, uh, including parks and forestry within the city, something that's pretty important, especially to somebody like me who's got a, a background in uh, environmental work. And it's really cool working with them because, because their scope is so expansive, because managing something like, you know, everything from the biodiversity of the trees in a city to making sure that the grass and the parks is mowed to making sure the bathrooms are kept fixed has um, really made their division just this giant, uh, like, for lack of a better word, like not monolith, but like a, this giant complicated um, technical landscape where uh, it can be very hard for them to get the information they're looking for. They're doing a, like considering that they do a pretty good job of like providing data sets. They're actually one of our bigger like uh, data owners on the portal. But that said, one of the interesting perspectives that I've gotten working with a group like that um, is, is an understanding that uh, grabbing data from these divisions, especially the big ones, is not as easy as asking them for something and then them pulling a spreadsheet out of their pocket and handing it to you. Um, it, there can be a lot of work that they have to do to know where that data is stored. It's usually in many different spots, extracting it, removing personal information from it, uh, and then providing it in a way that doesn't break any network rules. Um, it's, it's It can be really complicated for some of these data owners. So it's it's been cool to work with them and it's cool to it's good to have champions in, in certain places too um i hope that answers some of your questions um vis-a-vis -vis usership though um it's all over the place we've got like i mentioned uh, a lot of people in the public who use our data um, for projects uh, both academic and non-academic um some not-for-profits uh, a handful of people who've turned our data into like apps that have made some money um a handful of engineering firms that will use our data for day-to-day -day. Uh, and most um, one of the larger more recognizable names um, would be Airbnb that uses our short term actually I think I pulled it up here oh yeah it's this guy that uses our short-term rentals registration information to validate which of their Airbnbs in Toronto are legal are valid are allowed to be up uh, so <laughs> there's a lot um, we could talk about this for a while. I'd be happy to, to take some of these questions offline if you want. Um, That's perfect. Thank you, Mackenzie. I appreciate that. Thank you. Of course. Uh, just before we continue, because I'm aware uh, that we are a bit over our scheduled time. Um, Mackenzie, are you okay if we continue for a few more minutes to sure go thing. through the questions? Or, yeah? yeah, because if not, we can answer in a blog post or something like that. Like I, I can share it with um, all the participants. Up to you. Uh, I'm good to go for another hour. <laughs> okay, yeah. There is a great interest and in many questions, which is great. Um, okay, so I think next would be um, Amanda. Please go ahead with your question. 
And then whoever needs to go, you can just drop. Um, there will be a recording. There will be a recap blog post. So yeah, you'll be, you'll be fine. Um, OK, Amanda, you can go ahead. If you're still on the call. Okay. Hello. Oh, hello. Yes. OK, hi. Yeah, we can hear um, you. So my question is about freedom of information requests. And if you can comment on any insights or tracking that your team has done with the frequency and types of requests going up, hopefully down over time with the popularity of the open data portal. Thanks. Sure. Um, that's a really good question. Um, we actually have a data set on freedom of information requests. Um, so there's a little bit of a history on there. Um, if you want to like get the deep dive into it. Um, that said, uh, a lot of the data sets that we've made have been because a division comes to us and says, hey, we are getting FOI requests out the wazoo. Can we just put it up in the portal and not get any more? Um, so the short answer is, um, yeah, a lot of our data sets are born out of a need to reduce FOI requests. The long answer is take a look at the data set that we have relating to that and you can get some more details. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Masut, you can go ahead. Sure, but uh, I think I think the project is, uh, is so fascinating in so many levels for me. Um, uh, Two things. One is uh, much recent uh, because I think it would be a very, very good idea and saves a lot of agencies and, and intergovernmental uh, operators a lot of time to have a kind of a single repository of data and single source of truth, uh, but not necessarily know how to get there. Now that you've built the infrastructure for that and technologically made it somewhat more ac uh, accessible and doable, I think uh, you, you the, the, um, I would I would recommend to take the lead, not to be afraid of making it uh, a demand and, and a suggestion and, and run with it, because that will actually save in the long run millions and millions of dollars uh, in, 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 in so many ways. And uh, and then other protocols could be built on top of that in terms of the agency of the data owners in terms of housekeeping the data and and making sure and and this and that so it will redistribute the uh, responsibilities in a sense that uh, since this is the main repository of data everyone needs to be their their, their, their own homework and uh, housework if, if you like i think um, um i think strategically speaking within the next decade or so every every other uh, city should should move towards that way because of uh, the um, new modular systems that are more and more accessible these days and the open government and the open banking etc um, with with that in mind i think also it would be a very very good idea if you can create a case study of that because i know for a fact that a lot of the other big cities in let's say Middle East and North Africa and developing countries, they are struggling with, uh, to, as Please a matter Stephen, of fact, are you, are you keeping? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm currently in yeah, conversation keeping well, with keeping well. Yeah, it's been a, a weird time given, you know, it's years since we spoke, obviously with everything going on in the meantime, but uh, in general, all things considered good. Yes. So, someone is. Uh, King. Taking notes if you want to. Yeah. Um, but that's not possible if you share. You can continue. Uh, I think some. Uh, well, anyway, um, um, I'm I'm currently in conversation with other other people that they are literally suffering from multiple portals that. Well, I'd probably give me that if you wanted. Like if we partnered on it, what am I doing? Can you just like, mute them. Months? Two companies I'm involved. In. What's your own turnover demand? Me asking. Uh, like, I pro. I think it's. I could probably bring you that. Uh, let me just see if I'd qualify. I muted. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I muted him. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I was saying um, uh, that uh, there are multiple port portals within the same kind of um, local city that uh, it creates a lot of confusion and 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 uh, duplication of work and the the uh, you know the citizen will be suffering because as a result of that it's a waste of resources waste of time waste of everything yeah but because they don't um 
you have to bear in mind that you know city officials or um, you know government employees are not data architects and system solution architects they don't understand the technology in a sense that how it should be built and how it should be used they are just ordinary people with a general understanding of how to use uh, a smartphone or any anything else for that matter um, I think that uh, you can take it and, and run with it as an initiative uh, and I salute you because that's a very, very, I think strategically speaking, it's a hugely important thing to have a single source of truth, to be able to maintain all these data that would be accumulated considering the IoT that coming, every other thing that enables accumulation and, uh, of tons of data and, and that will once you've got that single source of truth in a sense per se then you would be able to argue about all those protocols and whatnot uh, because now you've got a foundation block if that makes sense yeah it, it, it definitely does and I, I appreciate the kind words um there, there are a number there's two things that i can say to this um first the city of toronto well you know we're, we're doing all right we're definitely not um we definitely have, we, we share that too many portals problem at the city too. Not maybe as bad as some other places, but um, while the open data portal um, has a number of data sets, um, the Toronto Public Library has its own portal, Toronto Police Service has its own portal, and our Toronto Transit Commission has its own portal. Now we, the city portal at the middle, pull all of that into one spot, but we're really just copying what already exists elsewhere. Um, and that's okay. There are a number of different organizations who are doing similar things. Um, I think the Canadian federal government is doing that to an extent. I haven't um, uh, investigated that too too much, but I've spoken to some of the guys on that team, and they're they're solid. Um, and um, I know that there's also a project at the University of Toronto looking to take many different levels of open data, both city level, provincial level, federal level, and then even other third party organizations and try to um, map their information under a single um, metadata schema. Because once you start making this single source of truth, like, like you're mentioning, it's really hard to find stuff because it's big and complicated. Uh, and so there's a project going on um, by the, I think it's called the School of Cities um, Urban Data Catalog at the University of Toronto, where these guys are trying to bring like a catalog of catalogs together, map it mm -hmm. under a single common metadata standard, so that you can get a number of different data sets in one spot, but then also find them easily. It's a big, big project to do that at a bigger scale than just at a city because they're doing it for all of Canada. Um, but it's it's worth, in a, in a lot of people's opinions, yours and mine, uh, it's it's worth the time. Um, anyway, yeah, thanks for the kind words and, and thank no, you very much. No, not at all. I think, I think you would, um, that, that's, that vicious cycle of other entities and private or public, trying to catalog and catalog of catalogs and and you know this is this is a whole endless loop that they're going to be stuck for for eternity unless there are there would be one place that all these accumulated already accumulated data is consolidated so there is a foundation block for data upon which everything else could be built in the future because otherwise with the with the speed of all these data that is create generated every single minute or every single day uh, then, then there's no way that, that, that there's no one single solution. But once a little foundation block is built, then it opens doors to actually um, orchestrate all those efforts uh, uh, according to that foundation block, and and then coordinate it together, as opposed to um, each of them individually through their own um, ecosystem deal with whatever is uh, thrown at them as a challenge if that makes sense that would become like a connection point and then something at a, at a um, country scale nationwide could be built because you've got already a foundation like that it could be as a coordinating block if you like mm -hmm. yeah i hear you i hear you okay guys let's proceed to questions from the chat um i'll start with the first one um hello from norwegian refugee council could you please walk through how you created your metadata schema Ooh, great question um this metadata schema that we have let me pull up an example one this this metadata schema predates me uh, i was not involved um, with the creation of it but i can tell you some of the the um 
perks of it, the benefits that we've had, and some of the reasons we have some of it. Um, a, a lot of the stuff is is really just useful for us to keep track of things. Uh, I will call out date last refresh as an obvious one, but when you combine that with a refresh rate, we'll have an idea of whether or not this is being kept uh, refreshed at the right schedule. We can see that in this case, it certainly is. This is refreshed daily and it was refreshed today, so that's good. We've got other data sets where that is not the case. Uh, and we'll actually leverage these um, synergies, for lack of a better word, um, to populate our data quality score. We also, out of necessity, will have metadata around um, having external links and contact information for data owners. Uh, and this is because at the Open Data team, we don't want to pretend to be experts on short-term rentals or free public Wi-Fi or fire incidents or COVID cases or opioid overdoses or any of the hundreds of data sets that we have. So it, it's really important for us to have that metadata so just so that we could redirect public inquiries to people who actually can answer them. The bits on civic issues, something that's not listed here, but on the filters in the previous page here. This is actually a city initiative, something unique to the city of Toronto, um, where they wanted to categorize data based off of five civic issues. And so we've added those civic issues just to make sure that they understand how much of those, how much data is populated in each of those issues. We've added topics as kind of a redundant additional layer to that, just so that it makes it easier to navigate things by a general concept of uh, a topic, a category, a type of data. Um, the short answer is we, we made it out of necessity, things that have worked for us um, in the long term. I, I, or sorry, long answer. I, I wasn't privy to the um, the process of making that, so I can't give you too, too much other information on that. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, let's address the next question in the chat. Could you share link to the plugin or code which yeah. are you are using for data quality section? Yeah, How is this sure. working besides metadata? Is it validating the description input and input text? Yeah. So the short answer uh, I had answered a little while ago, I think, to a previous question. Uh, there are more details that I'll share uh, in a link. Uh, with you, Ioana, that you can share with all the attendees of this, where it, we do a deep dive in paper of how each of the rules work, how the numbers are calculated, uh, and some of the guts of that. Um, it'll be better than me just blabbing about it here, I think. Perfect. Okay, next question. Are the two APIs in the architecture slide, this is slide number eight, a single data access API, or did you make a separate one to drive the WordPress site? Oh, no, these are the CCAN built in uh, CCAN actions. So um, these will be things like, and if you're, you're, this is in CCAN parlance, so if it doesn't make any sense to you, I'm sorry. But these are some of CCAN's built in um, API endpoints. So data store dump, data store search, uh, resource get, uh, package get, um, things that CCAN has built in. We, we lean on those a lot because they're great. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, next question. I can see uh, some people are raising hands, but I think we need to go through the questions from the chat first. So be patient, please. Um, from Eric, are you adding those extra formats into the file store under the same resource ID or are you adding additional files within the same resource? Great question. Someone wants to know about caching. That makes that was me so happy. During the presentation, yes. Sure, yeah. So um, how do I explain this? So um, each each package will have, in this case, this package has one data store resource. We will save that data store resource, and it stays. And then for each of these formats, we will add an additional file store resource. What we do is we have some custom metadata in people in... here, or is it just me that I don't? We can hear Mackenzie, yes. Okay, and you wanna, I'll, I'll start again, don't worry. So when it comes to storing metadata about our cached files, 
what we do for each CCAN instance, uh, sorry, for each CCAN package and for each of its data store resources, what we do is we create for each data store resource one associated file store resource. Because it's a separate file store resource, it gets a separate resource ID. Now, what we've done though is we've added some custom resource metadata to the data store resource, which in a JSON dict will map where this data store resources cached files are, what their resource IDs are. So basically, this single resource has four parts. It has the data store resource and it's three file store resources. And the data store resource has some custom uh, resource level metadata that will tell you where these other three file store resources are. So it keeps them connected at resource level metadata. And then up in WordPress, we do some through our custom um, WordPress theme, we just put all that into something that's nice and succinct here. So when I'm clicking on this, I'm just downloading one of those file store resources. Um, the, the logic and code behind that is also on the GitHub that I'll be sure to share with Ioana uh, later. And I'm happy to chat details about any of this if anyone uh, would be interested offline. Perfect, thanks. Okay, let's take Augusto's question. Uh, I know he's raising a hand and we like him, so please go ahead. <laughs> Uh, hello, and thank you, Joanna. I think uh, BZA Chilo86 has raised his or her hand first. Uh, but should I go? Or hand it over to them? Okay. Say it again. What? We can hear okay, uh, okay, I'll ask my question then. Uh, Hi, Mackenzie. Uh, the portal looks amazing. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm sorry I was a bit late. I'm not sure if this has been addressed before, but uh, this specific issue. Um, I uh, have been responsible to, uh, for uh, creating and maintaining the national data portal for Brazil using CCAN from 2012 until 2018. And uh, something we did there that I think was super great, but unfortunately was rolled back and uh, has not been available since 2019. Uh, the, uh, there was a feature um, that integrated uh, the portal with the ombudsman system. Like if someone uh, had a problem with the data, uh, for uh, instance, uh, I, I would like a specific column to be added to this table or uh, I know that uh, this line has uh, a wrong value, the cell in the table has a wrong value because I know something. And, uh, uh, or maybe just that the data is unav unavailable or not updated on the expected schedule. Uh, that's already a question for you. Uh, what do you do when the expected schedule of updating the data is not met? And is the only means for people to reach out to the data publisher, the email published there. Because uh, what I think was in really interesting in the system we had and no longer have is that the ombudsman system has um, bylaws uh, and deadlines in which uh, the data publisher must uh, reply. And that is formally registered. It's not just email and you can generate stati statistics uh, on how much people uh, make requests or complaints about data. And also um, that uh, uh, also something important is that uh, the complaint or uh, the message that the data publisher, the data publisher received uh, automatically uh, did have uh, the URL or uh, pointing to the exact data set. So that's also a problem that many data publishers have. Someone will send them an email and say, oh, I have this problem uh, with the data, it's not working, but they don't send the uh, 
uh, exact data set identification. Uh, may maybe the publisher has thousands of data sets on the portal and they don't know what the citizen's talking about. So uh, meeting those two ends with a uh, well uh, tightly knit system, I think was a really neat idea that I haven't seen yet reproduced anywhere else. And also we ourselves haven't been doing it anymore. So that's my question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll tell you, you, you guys, yeah, at least in some parts are a step ahead of us for sure. Um, we don't have a system beyond redirecting people to data owners via email to report issues. Um, this is the best that we have right now. Additionally, we also don't have any type of deadlines or um, policy or legislation that requires these owners to reply in a timely manner. That's something that that policy and legislation part is something that we're starting to work on, but it's still a ways away. So we're behind the ball uh, there. We still have some work to do there. Um, we we're are having. Game, unfortunately. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Because we don't have the system anymore. They have rolled ah, it back in 2019, right. so we don't have it anymore, but <laughs> that was a neat idea. Sorry. Oh, and that was part of it. The deadlines were part of it too, huh? Okay, yeah. Okay, well, we also don't have that then. Uh, I commiserate with you. Um, we are talking about a way where when a request is made from, you know, be it the public or um, within the city bureaucracy to update a data set, inquire about a data set, or create a new one, we are looking into a way where we can publish that information somewhere else on our portal so that people can see the status of an update of a data set or an inquiry about an issue about a data set. Um, that's also a ways away. That's actually a project though that we've got like code written. We've got our hands dirty doing it. So it's something that we are gonna do. That said, it's it we started only about a month ago where we're still a ways away from publishing something like that. And that would be our best attempt at something similar, but not quite the same. Okay, thank you. Now let's uh, continue with questions from the chat. Let me see, the next one would be... Uh, okay, I think it's... Do you have any need for combining datasets into new datasets, or do you have any data that repeats across multiple datasets, for example, reference data, postcodes, currency codes, etc.? This is a great question. Uh, so first, um, combining data sets. We are getting more and more of those. Um, at the beginning, when people would, would give us multiple that needed to be combined, we would provide them as separate distinct resources all downloadable from here you this one page that i'm showing on the screen now only has one download but we would provide two or three or four or five in some cases there are um instances though where that doesn't make sense and so we are um, adding capacity to some of our etl engines to do that merging it's not hard to do the merging um, it's hard to do the merging in a way that's scalable because we don't want to write custom code for every single new job that people make. We want to make a, a nice, neat template for doing this if possible. Now, regarding dupes and reference data, um, that definitely exists, and we definitely don't have a good way of tracking it. Um, for a while, actually, we were having a conversation with um, with Joel, who is or was at least on this call earlier, about a project that he's working on called Data Pusher Plus. And while it's not tailored to finding reference data, um, part of one of the many really cool things it's going to do um, as it's as it's being built, is make profiles, uh, summaries of um, information as it's entered into CCAN. And we were considering, and still are considering, leveraging something like that to be able to identify reference data and help us remove duplicate data sets or even kind of abstract certain attributes, maybe store them as reference data sets distinctly from everywhere else. Um, that's a ways off for us, though. It's It's an idea that we had. Um, we're not sure if we're going to be able to execute it anytime soon, but it's it was an idea that we've had for sure. Um, short answer, though, no, we don't have anything to address that right now. Thank you. And now that you mentioned Joel, question is his. Joel, I see you're still on the call. Would you like to um, ask your question? 
Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks, Mackenzie. Thank yeah, I, I had the pleasure of meeting you personally and uh, seeing the story of Open of Toronto Open Data. Um, but, but one thing that I was, my question was about was, you know, I think the, the theme is, you know, if this is seen as infrastructure, as critical infrastructure for the city, and it kind of fell into becoming the, the, the digital highway for sharing data between the city divisions. Perhaps, you know, I think one, one thing that we've seen that works is since you have very good executive sponsorship, is perhaps you get them to update the policy and give it the force of law and make it an ordinance. So then everybody in the divisions will have mandates to like say publish or if they get the FOIL requests, they actually publish the the response as open data. Uh, yeah, because everything is digital now. All, all data is born native, digital. So yeah. why not use, use if, if, if you look at roads and bridges as critical infrastructure, data is now the, the, the raw data of the digital government. So I don't want to editorialize too much, but yeah, I, I love what you guys are doing. Thanks, Joel. I appreciate the kind words. And yeah, actually, we're we're slow in this, but we, we're, we've actually started in some regards um, adding, for lack of a better word, some teeth to the program when it comes to requiring data in certain contexts. For example, um, Toronto.ca, the city website, has all kinds of data visualizations up on it. Um, we finally got... Um, rules in place where if somebody makes some type of a dashboard or a map or something that they're required to take the underlying data of that and post it on our portal. Um, and that's great. We've had some success with that. There's still details of it we're working out because it's newer, but at least the general idea and some of the general policy around it exists. We also have a mandate to take things, um, reports that have data and figures that have been given to city council and post those on the portal. Um, while that's a mandate right now, it's very vaguely worded. Uh, and so we haven't implemented anything on that. So we're starting to engage to figure out what exactly that looks like in real life. So, uh, yeah, man, uh, I, I'm on the same page as you. Um, and what's fortunate is the city of Toronto is starting in that direction. But when I say starting, like we're starting, like we're still really early on in the process. Um, if we start putting together some cool things in either of these regards, though, I'll be sure to report it back to this community because um, it, it's got a lot of promise. Um, the right policy with the, with the right platform in place could, could really do some good for the city. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Joel. Thanks. Um, OK, we have a message in the chat from Kim from Datagov. Uh, she said that she'll be reaching out to you. Um, I'll make sure um, your contacts are in the meeting notes document. And of course, people can reach out to me and ask uh, for them. Next question. We have some similar metrics on an internal private dashboard for Dublin's open data portal. Uh, oh, no, this is not a question. This is just a comment where the individual local authorities wind up having to work on making their data more current or complete. Okay, next question from Amrita. General question. Do you have any details or pointers when scaling CCAM, like blog posts, videos, documentation? Uh, ooh, for us, no. Uh, sure wish we did. Um, we haven't had any huge issues with CCAN and scaling. Um, when it comes to scaling, our issues have been with uh, some of the infrastructure behind it, the database that we use, the server that we use, um, even some of the extensions. So the, the caching extension, for example, um, that's something that we made. And we have had to deal with the problems um, of it scaling with larger and larger data sets. Um, there's like maybe one or two minor things um, that we've had to deal with, but a lot of it's really like tailored to, to us. So short answer, sorry, no, I don't have anything super useful um, when it comes to scaling CCAN generally. I'm happy to chat details offline though, if, if you wanted to talk about that. Okay. Um, all right, uh, question from, Esdras, um, 
if you're using solar as a search engine? Yes. Yes, you already answered that. Next question, what about more advanced data formats for download? Bracket, Org, Avro, et cetera. Ooh. Um, we haven't considered that. Um, there was one other CAD specific spatial data set format that we were considering, whose name I've forgotten. Um, we were thinking about it, but we couldn't figure it out. And so we put it on the shelf and haven't picked it back up since. Um, so short answer, no, we haven't really thought about it. OK, uh, then. So next question, I have a long answer a question, maybe for another session. It's about legal background for information disclosure. Can you provide a link to the Canadian laws covering all these initiatives? Ooh. I am not the right guy to do that, unfortunately. Um, I'm but a yeah. lowly software developer, and I'm not the right guy to help you there. <laughs> Sorry. That's fine. OK, I think these are the questions from the chat. Um, I need to mention that people are really impressed with your presentation. They say you really rock, uh, and I agree as well. Uh, so, yeah, um, I think we have Masut again raising um, his hand. You can go ahead. And after that, I suggest we wrap it up. Thank you. I've, I've got so many questions. but. One one issue was raised by Agosto, I think, and and in conjunction with the fact that you said you're only at the moment you're redirecting whoever raises the query to the data owners uh, through email kind of thing. Usually, um, usually, sometimes they'll come straight to us because they'll ignore the data owner email, so we still have to field them sometimes. But usually, yes. Yeah, I think uh, on top of my head, the, the simple simple solution for that would be to um, integrate a, like a helpless system into the, the ticketing system, because it will engage the data owners as a stakeholder. And then on top of that, then you can engage the policies, whoever is in charge of the policies, if, if they are supposed to update the data, et cetera, et cetera. You can create a basis in order to connect different stakeholders into the same issue from different angles so once a ticket is raised in the help desk uh, then the the, the the citizen gets an update because they've got an access to that the data owners they get a access to the, the ticketing system so they need to update it with whatever it is then the city level they get an access to that in in terms of whether they need to update the policy and uh, update the ticket accordingly so uh, I cannot tell you enough uh, what you've been doing and uh, your presentation is, is truly intriguing. I think it, if, uh, if you keep building different modules that will create uh, interconnecting uh, points uh, on, on a module level, uh, module basis, but on a same foundation block, maybe once for all, someone actually cracked it and uh, make the government work more, uh, work more efficiently and not be as, as wasting uh, public resources uh, altogether. Um, so I, I wouldn't take it lightly. I think what you're doing is, is phenomenal, phenomenally important uh, on so many levels. Thank you, Masood. I appreciate that. It's really Hats nice off to, to you guys. Hats Thank off you. to you. Okay, I think uh, it's about time we close. Um, let me share my... Uh, is that a new question? Just let me open the chat. No, these are just thanks. People are very happy. So, um, Okay, that's a wrap, guys. Um, this is our final second month July for 2023. As I said, a big shout to Mackenzie for the fantastic presentation. Your work um, on the portal is truly impressive and inspiring. It basically 
led us to set a new record. record. Um, our community meetup has overrun for almost one hour and uh, 40 minutes. This is the first time we're doing something like that. Usually we are very, uh, I mean, if we're overrun, it will be 15 minutes, no more. Um, the sheer volume of, question, of questions is a testament to the interest um, your work has sparked and um, the impact of your work. So this is truly remarkable. Thank you a lot. And special thanks to Adria. I think you're still on the call uh, for bridging the connection with Mackenzie. Uh, yeah, okay, so um, we are taking a break in December, as I already mentioned a um, couple of times, um, but we are already excited for 2022, 2024, pardon. Um, we are on the lookout now for engaging CKM related projects and topics for our next year sessions. So if you have some um, interesting CCAM project or topic that you're passionate about or that you want to showcase, um, please, we invite you to apply. You can do it by filling out the form. It's available in our meeting notes document. It's available on this presentation that you see on screen. Um, and you can also write directly to me. Up to you. Um, we have a special document for suggestions for topics and speakers. Um, you can find it in the meeting notes document. Don't forget to subscribe for our newsletter. Um, we are not taking a pause with it. We will be issuing it monthly. So um, yeah, you can subscribe to get news and updates. Now, if you want to um, get involved, um, uh, with Sikkim project, you can uh, go to sikkim.org slash community and you'll find many links there. Um, you can um, um, you can check out the, the dev meetings. They happen every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, you can head to GitHub discussions and uh, get involved there. If you have some questions, you can chat with us on Gitter. You can check out Stack Overflow, many useful links and a vibrant community. And um, last but not least, let's stay connected. Um, we have social media channels. Uh, we have Twitter, LinkedIn. We have a LinkedIn group, YouTube website. We are posting on the blog. So um, yeah, follow us everywhere to get uh, fresh updates. Thank you for joining us today. And um, till we meet again, keep those data fires burning. Thanks a lot. I hope to see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Um, people can um, expect uh, on the recording on the YouTube channel and also recap blog posts in the next few days. Oh, and you and I will send you some of those resources that I mentioned uh, via email in the next couple of minutes. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll share uh, through all our channels, newsletter, blog, YouTube, video, everywhere. <laughs> yeah, great presentation, really impressive. Well, thank it's, you. Thanks, guys. It's wow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, thanks. We'll be in touch. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Thank you. Bye bye.